G'day there, Nick Bowditch here. Uh, today, I'd like to do something a little bit different. Um, you, like me, might have had a bit of a work <laughs> disturbance, or a disturbance in how you work and how you perform your job recently with the global pandemic. I know I certainly have, and, and lots of other people who work in the events industry as I do. I, I speak at events all around Australia and around the world, um, and they're basically not on, not happening at the moment. So we've all been kind of disrupted in that way. So I can kind of choose how I react to that. And I can certainly choose to sulk and be sad and be miserable and angry about it um, and cool up in my shell and, and just hate the world. Or I can get up, get dressed, show up and decide what, I, what I've decided to just do my gigs anyway. Um, that were scheduled on the days that they were going to happen. And I've never done this at home before in my lounge room with, uh, you know, birds chirping and dogs barking and the renos happening two doors up and noise from the street and stuff, but we'll see how it goes, right? It might, uh, it might be worth watching for a couple of minutes. It might not be. Um, I'm stoked that you're watching it at all. So let's see if we can make it a little bit uh, entertaining and hopefully um, I can show you something that might help you to think differently as well. So today's gig was going to be in Brisbane for a room of uh, an audience of retailers. And the topic they wanted me to speak on, come to speak to this group of, uh, group of people about, um, is resilience. So that's what I'm doing today. Um, how to create a healthy, strong and resilient life is the presentation I was going to do today in Brisbane. And now I'm gonna do it today in Terrigal, New South Wales, in my lounge room for you. Um, if you would like to watch it. So, without further ado, let's go. Oh, it's comforting to know that I, I still make stuff ups with the tech even in my lounge room. Now let's go. How to create a healthy, strong and resilient life. The first thing I'm going to start with is, is just the story. It's just a little bit about, about me and why I've had to tap into my resilience and why I've had to find that resilience in, in my life. And um, I start this, I start a lot of my presentations this way because it kind of grounds me for a start and, and makes me feel comfortable to speak in front of the audience. But it also gives the audience a bit of an idea of why I am so close to resilience, why I do believe so strongly in it, why I want you to believe so strongly in it and be able to find your own, um, and so on. So I, I am someone who, first of all, um, has had a kind of checkered, successful and unsuccessful career as an entrepreneur and small business and startup person. I've had a couple of wins along the way, but I've failed many, many, many times, much more often then I've actually had a success in business and in life for that matter. Um, so I have had to dig into resilience a lot, you know, into that moment where you go, oh, fuck, is it just, is it me? I, I can't, I can do nothing but stuff up and, and all that sort of feelings and those voices in your head that tell you that stuff about your business life. Um, but I have had a couple of wins in, in the startup land and, and I come from a startup and small business background. And I ran my own small business for a while, built and sold a couple of pretty successful ones. And then I was recruited by Facebook to go and work with them, to go and work in that big machine, um, which was awesome, which was just a great experience for me. And I, I, I loved every single minute of it. You know, I worked there for a few years. I, I ran small business operations for Australia and New Zealand in, in my little patch of Asia Pacific. Um, I worked with geniuses every day. I was quite often the dumbest person in the room, in an office, which, in a meeting, which was great. Uh, I learned a lot through that about myself, but also about how people interact, how people communicate, how people deal with things, how people grow and grow businesses, but grow themselves through that business as well. And because of that, I was able to kind of tap into a little bit of my own growth and reasons for my own non-growth, which we'll talk about a bit today. So. I have had that successful kind of and unsuccessful career part of my life, that professional part of my life. And that's kind of one side of me. You know, if you Google me, you'll find that stuff. But there's another side of me too. Sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> that's my Google home. She doesn't understand. Um, there's, another, 
<laughs> there's another side of me too, and that is I'm somebody who lives with mental illnesses. I, I'm someone who, who sometimes can't live my life very effectively because of how my brain works. Quite often though, I, uh, most of the time, um, I do control that stuff well. You know, I have things that help me control that stuff well, tools as well as medication that helps me. But also just that being able to tap into the resilience of keeping going, like get up, show up, get dressed, keep moving, do this sort of stuff, you know, which helps me immeasurably with my mental health challenges. I, I live with depression and anxiety. Sometimes the depression is so marked in my head that I can't get out of bed. You know, sometimes that's for a snooze button, sometimes it's for a morning or a day, sometimes it's really ordinary for a few days. And uh, it's not great, you know, but it's, but it's kind of me. It makes up who I am, so I'm still grateful for it in, in, in some ways. I also live with anxiety. I'm kind of not grateful for that. I'd rather that not happen to me if that's all right, thanks. But uh, the anxiety is, is, is crippling sometimes, and it's, it's not great. You know, it's not something that I love... I love about me. It's not something that I wish on anybody else for that matter. You know, it's, it's hard anxiety. If you're watching this and you live with anxiety too, you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's shithouse. It's awful. And you know, I'd really rather I didn't deal with that, but I do. Third little piece of the puzzle there for me is that I also live with complex PTSD. So, um, as a result of childhood trauma, things that happened to me when I was a kid, for a few years, a few sustained kind of traumatic things. Um, and that trauma, I then buried away in my head for 30 years until it all came rushing back a few years ago. And now it's constantly in my head and, and I have to live with that stuff. There's something, there's a point there that I wanna to make too. And that's, I think words have power. You know, I, I, you might hear me um, refer to, you know, living with depression, living with anxiety, living with a mental health challenge a mood disturbance, whatever it might be, I very rarely say I'm, I struggle with dot, 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 or I battle against depression, yeah? I, I try not to use those words because that sets up something which is far harder for me to succeed in, right? If I make it an adversarial battle between me and depression, depression's this big, hairy monster that's, that's too big for me. I, I, I can't win that fight. I don't want to get a fight with it. I want to I want to live with it, you know. I want to sit beside it. So that's why I use those words, and you'll hear me use that stuff a lot. And I think when you're talking about resilience, then it's kind of an important uh, thing to remember as well that words have power. So because I live with all those things, and because for a long time I anaesthetized those feelings, those uneasy feelings, or the abnormal feelings that were happening in my head and still happening in my head. Um, you know, I used to anesthetize that with all sorts of stuff and, uh, and developed a couple of addictions along the way. And thankfully through my own resilience, as well as a lot of help, a lot of therapy and, and a lot of really good people in my life, I now live addiction free. Um, and, but it's always kind of in my head that I could easily go back there if I forget how to tap into that resilience, even just for a day. So that's kind of my story and why I think resilience is important and why I think it's worth talking about, you know, I think it's worth us all concentrating on, on, on how to tap in our resi into our resilience when we need it, um, how to feel it, do we all have it? You know, the, and one of the hardest things about that is you don't know you need it and you don't know you have it until you go through a whole lot of shit in your life to, to find it. You know, that's why it's hard. You have to get through a whole lot of crap in your life before you even find that you have it far less that you needed it or that you could use it or you know how to tap into it. So let's start there. Let's start with the mental health stuff. Let's start with the thoughts and the actions that come from our thoughts that can sometimes mean that we do have to tap into our resilience maybe a, bit, a little bit earlier than we might have liked to. The first thing I want to sort of talk about in that regard is, you know, we, we talk about health and illness and mental health and illness, and I think this is really important. I think, in, I think in a few years' time, we as humans are going to talk about just health and illness, right? Just, if you like, normal and not normal. Not, not so much, you know, that, that something is mental health and physical health or mental health and physical illness it's just health and illness like it's all just part of it right because for me i know that if i 
lived with diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis or asthma or any of those things, a heart condition or, or something, then I would take medication for that and without any shame at all. I would, you know, I'd talk about it openly with people. People would openly talk about it with me. How's it going? You know, are you well? Is there anything I can do to help you be more well? All that sort of stuff. But just because my chronic illness happens to live in my brain, two things happen. First of all, I feel shame about telling you or telling the world about it for some reason, particularly as a man, right? But the second thing then is people don't talk to me about it either. People don't want to talk about that stuff. It makes them feel uneasy, right? So I, I really hope that one day we can just not have to think about that, not have to hide it, not have to be ashamed or feel any shame about what's going on for us. Like I didn't, I didn't choose this. I didn't, I didn't pick it off a rack and say, oh, I'll have the depression and anxiety, I'm chucking some complex PTSD things. Like that's not, that's not exactly how it works. So I, because it wasn't my fault that, that it's in my head in the first place, I'm not going to take the shame for that. That's not, it's not my shame to carry, you know? So I think that's the first thing is just sort of normalizing how we're feeling, normalizing that some people do need to tap into their resilience and some people will never do, need to. God bless them. I'm so jealous of you, but if that's you, good for you, man, more power to you. But if you're like someone like me who, who has had to or will perhaps need to tap into your resilience, then, then we're going to talk a little bit more about that. How to decrease your mental health, right? So we talk a lot about how to make it better, but we don't talk much about how we can ruin it, how we do ruin it each day. You know, the, the, the first thing for me is, is as soon as I become disconnected, as soon as I become disconnected, I'm not only am I more at risk of my mental illness rearing up and running, my, running the show again, but I'm also more likely to seep into addictions, to move into a place where addiction can take over my life and where, where my actions and, and my thoughts that, that, that drive those actions are really unhealthy, you know? It's kind of like there's this spectrum, right, where connections at this end and addictions at the other end, they can't, they can't coexist. They can't live in the middle together, right? So they live at opposite ends. And, and as long as I stay really connected, then I'm much less likely to become addicted. And so, and that can be, you know, I mean, addiction comes in all forms. It's not just, it's not just drugs and alcohol. It's, you know, some people have problems with gambling. Some people have problems with work, with sex, with porn, with eating, with um, donuts, with jelly beans, with running, with, you know, all, all sorts of things that can, that can become an unhealthy attachment. And that's the stuff that I really want us all to avoid by, you know, increasing our mental health. So we can decrease our health by becoming A, unconnected, disconnected, right? L to, to throw away connection or to not seek connection with self or others or people, places, or things around us which might help us. Secondly, obviously, not moving, not exercising in any way, not getting outside of a house in any way can decrease your mental health, food, and our food intake and our relationship with food and our relationship with eating obviously decrease our mental health. Other people, <laughs> other people can decrease our mental health. You know who you are and you've probably got people in your life who, who think you might be that person too. You know, all of those things add up, all of those things matter, you know. So if that's all then how you decrease it, then let's look at how you, how you increase it, right? How, how does, how does, how does what we do matter what, what we do physically matter emotionally or spiritually or intellectually or in terms of our mood and our mental health safety, right? How do we increase our mental health? We do that by connection with people. We do that by reaching out, by communicating, by saying, hey, I've got a problem. I'm not, not sure what's happening here. I don't like it. I need to tell you. I need to tell someone about it, you know, and for someone else to be there. And that might be you. Maybe you're the one that needs to be there for somebody else too. And that's a really important cog in the wheel as well, right? How do you increase it? You, you, you move, you get up, you show up, you get dressed. You, you don't sit around the house watching Netflix for too long. Um, I, don't, I don't mind watching Netflix for a little while here and there. And I, I certainly, I mean, I even schedulize and diarize time in my diary that I call fuck all time, which is just, is just me to do whatever I want. But watch Netflix or uh, sit under a tree or, you know, meditate or do whatever I want to do that, 
that's my time and I decide how to use that and no, no one else. And I think that's something that a lot of us could, could do a better job of, you know. Um, eating appropriately, having a healthy relationship with food, having a healthy relationship with alcohol, if that's part of your life too, you know, and, and, and just making sure that we put ourselves first. All of those things add up to the, the sum total of our mental health, the sum total of our mental safety. And that's actually a really, really good point because so often we care about others much more than we care about ourselves. So often we speak about others much better than we speak about ourselves. And that's not, that's not okay. It's not okay in the long run. It's not okay, especially if you have children in your home like I do and children in your life like I do who, who watch every single thing you do. You know, they're constantly learning from you. So increasing your mental health is many, many spokes in that wheel. And it's not like you need them all, but you certainly need some, and you need to have some effort on at least one of those things um, to be able to, I do at least, to be able to, you know, increase my mental health, increase my mental safety. Why resilience is hard, you know? Like, it is hard. It's hard to tap into it. It's hard to find it sometimes. It's hard to believe we even have it sometimes. You know, and it's because we don't need it until we need it. It's because it's it's on the other side of a whole lot of crap you've got to get through in your life, a whole lot of hardship and things not going your way before you even know it's there, far less how to tap into it, right? So that's that's why it's hard and why for a lot of people, I, I speak to a lot of people in a, in a, in a one-on-one therapy situation, which is part of what I do in my business. Um, and, and a lot of those people just say to me, you know, I don't, I don't think I have any resilience. And you know, I try to say that, hang on, you've just listed the 16 challenges you've had mentally in the last year. And we're sitting here today, both alive, both able to speak about it and speaking about it. Like there's no doubt that that person has resilience and has tapped into it. But we don't necessarily always recognize that we have or recognize that we need to. And it's a really important skill that, that we all have. Resilience is something we all have. We, we don't need to worry if you're somebody, if you're the 1% who was born without it, you weren't. You just haven't needed it yet. Thank God, right? And or well, thank whoever. But, you know, I, I think it's really important to understand that, that we all have it. We all know where it is. We don't all necessarily need it yet or have, net, have needed it yet. But if we do, we can all access it. Often... On the way to resilience, I go through kind of mixed feelings about things, situations where I, I either act appropriately or I don't, or I either act out or lash out or I don't. And, and a lot of those things can happen just when I think something has happened or I think that somebody thinks a certain thing about me or whatever. And I can go quite crazy about that stuff, right? I can see somebody past somebody in the shopping center, right? And, and I think, I th- and I know them, right? And I think they saw me, but they just brushed me. Cause could, and, and then, my, then my, my mental health record starts. It says, oh, they think you're a dickhead. They think you're a piece of shit. They think you're this, they think you're that, blah, blah, blah. And it builds into this huge thing that, you know, she mightn't have even seen me, but, but I have already jumped to the fact that she definitely saw me and she definitely thinks I'm a piece of shit and this is definitely why and now she's telling other people as well. Like all of that stuff is, is mad, right? I know it's mad and I know in my rational intellectual mind that it's not real. But you know, sometimes when I'm not well or sometimes when I just have a lot of stuff going on or I'm not feeling particularly great about myself in the first place, when that stuff happens, it can, it can be the top of the slippery dip, you know? And I'm starting to... I'm starting to slide. So in that case, I, I, I come to these three questions. I use this little tool a lot. Whenever I feel a bit of dis-ease, whenever I feel a bit uneasy about a certain situation or I think, oh, here we go, same old thing or whatever, and that person definitely saw me, you know, and, and whatever. And I, I go into, I can go, again, sitting at the top of that slippery dip, I can go down a spiral of all sorts of stuff. Or... I use this little tool of these three questions. The first question I ask myself is, is it real, right? Did she really see me? Is there data? Is there proof? Is there a proof point that she absolutely saw me? 
right? For, just in this instance, but this you can apply this to any situation where you start to feel a bit a bit mad, right? Is it real? Number one, and if the answer to that is yes, then I go on to the next question. If the answer is no, which it almost always is, then I have to give myself permission to let that feeling go, to let that memory go. And I, when I say that, I'm very careful about the words I use. Right? I give myself permission to let that feeling go. That doesn't mean I let that feeling go. <laughs> And sometimes, you know, I'm not perfect. Sometimes I go, well, I don't know, you know, I can see it wasn't real, but I still feel crazy about it, right? And I'll still ruminate on that stuff and it resonates for quite a while sometimes. But I give myself permission to let it go, which means, yeah, I could, I could let it go. And for, in the most part, I do, thankfully. But if the answer is yes, then I go to the question number two. Question number two is, can I change it? So again, in this instance of someone in the shopping center, this is a flippant instance and you can apply it to big, actual, real important stuff in your life too. But you know, can I change it? Well, no, I can't change it. It's happened the other day. I, you know, I'm pretty sure she saw me. I'm pretty sure that was real, but can I change it? No, like if she does think I'm a dickhead, I can't change that either. That's her thought. She's allowed to have that. You know, the answer is no. And if the answer is no, then I give myself permission to let that feeling go. But if the answer is yes, and I can change it, right? I, I could get after her and pull up and say, hey, hey, how you going? I think, I think you saw me. I was waving, yeah, or whatever. Then, then I can do that. And obviously that's going to help my mental safety and my mental health clarity out of that thing too, right? So if it's yes, I move on to question three. If it's no, then I give myself permission again to let that feeling go. Doesn't mean I do, but at least I've given myself permission to let it go. If it's real, if I can change it, those two, two answers to those two questions is yes, then I go to question three. Does it matter anyway? And this is where almost 99.9% .9 of all the crazy stops. Because, you know, will this matter in five minutes? Will this matter in five days? Will this matter in five years? Does it matter that she saw me? She brushed me. I could change it, but, and I tried, but she doesn't care. You know, can I change, you know, does that matter to my life? No. Does it matter in my life if someone thinks I'm a dickhead, someone I'm barely connected to, doesn't think a certain thing about me or does think a certain about me? No, it doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters, right? And when I'm, again, when I'm well and when I'm intellectually sort of safe and rational and all that stuff, I can see that it doesn't matter. But, you know, again, if it's a cumulative effect of a whole lot of stuff going on at that time, then it can be harder. There's no doubt about that in my life. So, can I, so does it, like, does it matter is a, is a great kind of full stop on that. Because even if it's real, even if I can change it, it probably doesn't matter. And if it does, then, then we work on that too. There's, if, if by some chance it gets through those three gates, all is yes, yes, yes which is hardly ever, I can tell you, I don't think, I can't even remember an instance, then, you know, I can, I can give, give myself permission to work on it. But often those things are rested. So if you're going through a bit of a disturbance or if you, if someone really pisses you off or if a situation really gets up your nose, you know, in the next day or two or whatever, maybe you could just think of those three questions and, and it, it might just help you get through something without having to even go near your resilience because you're not actually turning it into a, a tantrum. You're not actually turning it into a, a kind of, um, you know, a, an event in your life, you know, a cerebral incident where you're like, oh, that person, you know, and that which turns into then, oh, that person thinks I'm a piece of shit. Am I? I wonder if I am. I must be. You know, for a lot of us, that's kind of the progression of that stuff. So those three questions might help you out. I hope they do, because they really help me out on an almost daily basis. The last thing that I want to talk about with resilience is I, I, I agreed to come today <laughs> to this big audience um, <laughs> to talk about resilience and to give some takeaways that people could go away with. So in with that in, in mind, I want to talk about the 13 steps that I use to tap into my own resilience that I encourage other people to use to tap into theirs. Resilience in 13 easy steps, uh, 13 not so easy steps, I should say, because it's certainly not easy, but we can, we can apply these things and we can most, for, for the most part, we can 
get through to our resilience and, and not actually need it if we do a better job of, of these 13 things. The first thing is be careful how you speak to other people. Now, not everyone deserves our forgiveness. Not everyone deserves our kindness. But kindness is never wasted. You know, it's never, I always often say to a business um, audience, you know, in your business, how you plan your business, how you execute your business, you're never going to lose business by being kind. You only ever gain it. And, and it's the same in our personal life too. That's never wasted. So how you speak about other people tends to focus that energy, that negative energy back on yourself in some way, put you in a space where you're perhaps not being the best version of yourself. It certainly does for me. So I try and, and I'm trying to be really careful about how I speak to other people. Um, you know, I try not to get in blues with people, obviously, but I don't try, I try not to really, there's no, sometimes there's no reason for me to tell someone they're a dickhead. You know, like I don't need, I don't need to give them my opinion. And you know what? They don't have to listen. But just because I think it's true doesn't mean it's true. Just like the chick in the supermarket who I mentioned before. She thinks I'm a dickhead. That's her prerogative. I, I don't have to be guided by that. My life isn't changed by that. It doesn't matter. So that's the first thing. Be careful how you speak to other people. Secondly then, be careful how other people speak about you. And that's both to your face and outside outside of your knowledge is, is, is an important thing here, right? Because how they speak to you, to your face, is probably the only thing that actually matters. If we go, is it real? Can we change it? It doesn't matter anyway. Then if someone's bagging you without you knowing it, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter anyway. Does, does their opinion define your life? Does their opinion make you change your life in any way? No, probably shouldn't. Right, so I, I just I just think it's really important to think about being careful how other people speak to you. If if someone is in your life in a in an intimate situation or in a relationship or in a family or a friend or a community contact person who you have a lot to do with, and they're consistently poor in how they speak to you, and you're consistently okay with that, then there has to be a line somewhere where you take some responsibility for that too. You don't have to be somebody else's doormat. You don't have to tap into your own resilience just, just to appease somebody else being a dick themselves, right? So be careful how other people speak about you. Number three, be careful how you speak about yourself. I talk a lot about self-talk. I talk a lot about self-love. And the reason for that is the majority of us do it really, really poorly. The majority of the stuff that we say to ourselves when we're not that great we're not going that great, right? And we say, oh, you know, you're a piece of shit, you're this, you're a loser, you're dumb, you're fat, you're ugly, you're poor, you're not good enough, you're, you're not enough. A lot of that stuff that we say to ourselves, even just in our head, you would never in a million years say to someone else. And if you said that, if, if I said that to somebody else and you were sitting next to me, you'd have a go at me about that, right? But for some reason, saying mean things to ourselves is okay it's not okay right so i'd be really careful about that stuff because it actually defines how you show up to the world as well you know if you're constantly telling yourself a pe that you're a piece of shit then eventually that's how you're going to show up that's how you're going to present yourself to the world and the world doesn't need that from you the world needs the best version of you the world needs the positive version of you that says okay i've got some flaws I've got some little creaks, creaks and cracks, but here I am. This is me, and, and, and I'm doing my best. This is the best version of me. Number four, try to be honest, even when it's really hard. And I've learned this over and over and over and over in the last sort of decade of my life, that when, you, when you're not honest, and I don't just mean just lying, but like when you don't, show up honestly, when you don't um, engage with someone honestly, when you don't embrace someone in an honest way, then you're just not being the authentic version of yourself. You're just not being the best version of yourself and you're not demanding somebody, the best version of somebody else either. I think that 
honesty is hard in different situations you know it's people often say after I, I do a gig and like this and I talk about my abuse history and people are like oh fuck that's that must be so hard you know and it is it's really hard but it's not easy but every time I do it it's easier every time I'm more honest I get payback for that so I'd really support you in this way too to think about trying to be as honest as you can as often as you can even when it's really hard fifth one then is to make mistakes loads of them i told you before at the start that i'm a successful and unsuccessful entrepreneur i've made a shitload of mistakes and i continue to today and i will forever you know perfectionism isn't if all the crazy in my head luckily perfectionism isn't isn't in there anywhere um i don't try and be perfect i try and be valuable I try and add value. I try to show up authentically and, and add value. And that means that I will make mistakes. That also means if I'm making mistakes, I'm trying new things. I'm doing something I'm not particularly au okay fait with or proficient at, then I'm going to grow from that, even if I make a mistake at it. And this is something I talk about a lot to high school kids and different audiences like that, that, that have that kind of perfectionist thing or have a situation they're going through like a HSC or end of year, end of school exams and, you know, they're so terrified to make an error because they think it's going to affect their whole life. They think they get, it's going to reverberate through their whole life. And very few of our mistakes do that, if any. So I'd really support you to get out there and make mistakes. Make mistakes with people, make mistakes with places, make mistakes with things, make mistakes in your work. Um, that, means, that means you're growing and it means you're trying something new and that you weren't really au okay with and, and all that proficient at in the first place. Get your esteem from within. So many of us, especially when we're not doing very well, we tend to get our esteem from outside, right? We get our esteem from our salary, our home, our car, our bank balance, um, things, boats, holidays, flashy stuff. Instagram is, is the big villain here for a lot of people, you know. And we feel like if we don't have those things, then we aren't worth anything. You know, we, we, we don't have an identity other than things. It's a really sad, really sad indictment on, on, on humans. Now that, that we can't get esteem from those, from things that matter, like how kind we are, how much empathy we show, you know, what we do for someone else, how we feel about someone else. Those things matter, you know? And, uh, and it's, not, it's not the size of your bank, about, a bank account, it's how much of that bank account you will be happy to spend and be happy to entertain yourself and others with and, and all of that stuff. All, this, all, this, all the good stuff that comes again through connection is how to get your esteem from within. Stuff eventually does not matter. But what matters is how we use stuff how we give stuff, how we receive stuff, all of that stuff does actually matter. So I'd really support you to find ways to get your esteem from within. Connect, don't isolate. I said this at the start, and it's, it's, you know, it's a really important thing for both, both me and I'm, I'm guessing for you too, that you know we are social animals, we're pack animals, we are part of a herd, we are built to be in community to be in relationship with others. We're built that way. We don't get to choose it. We're built that way, right? So because of that, we need connection. And remember at the opposite end of connection in that spectrum is addiction. And we definitely don't want that. So, you know, somewhere in between is how we have to manage our life. To be connected with people, not necessarily in someone's pocket all the time or need somebody else to be in yours all the time either. You've got to have your own existence. You've got to have your own space. But a complete lack of connection is really unhealthy for me. And, and I, I know that when I get into that space, that's kind of the first sign. It's kind of the first signal that, oh, shit, hang on, something's, something's not right here, you know, like something, I'm not going so well. When I, when I don't get back to people with a text message for two, three days, or, if I'm, or at all, or I'm not answering my phone for a week, or, you know, I don't go out, or any of those things that are little red flags for me to say, this is the start of it, mate. This is where I start. This is, I, first, I disconnect 
first I isolate and then I start getting further and further down that slipper dip. So connect, don't isolate is a really big one for me and it might be a really big one for you too. Listen, listen and speak up as well. So, so many people I think feel like communication and a conversation is waiting for their turn to speak. <laughs> you probably know people like this, you might be someone like this. I can be like that sometimes where I, I'm just sitting there and there's a conversation happening and I'm like, okay, now's my turn. And I jump in and, and cause I have to share a story cause the world has to be, you know, about me. And, uh, and I have to be the most entertaining and funny and whatever. Um, that stuff's not great by the way, but that's how I think. Um, so, you know, by, by listening and by speaking when it's, when it's, when it's right to speak, not necessarily just when it's your turn is a really good way for us to manage our communication and in turn manage the resilience that we have through a situation. Because sometimes you just need to talk about something for it to be diluted. Sometimes you just need to show up and say, Hey, I need to talk to you about what happened the other day because I feel this. Not because you have made me feel this. I, you can't make me feel anything. But I feel like this after that situation and can I tell you about that? It's actually a really healthy, really adult way to conduct a conversation as opposed to yelling and screaming and chucking things. Feel everything. This is something I, I talk to my kids a lot about too, you know, that when we were kids, and certainly when our parents were kids, um, they were told, they weren't told necessarily explicitly, but they, but through actions and inference, they were told, don't feel that. Don't, don't cry. Don't be emotional. You know, don't be, and in turn, don't be too happy either. Don't get too big for your boots. The world doesn't revolve around you. You know, think of the starving kids in Africa, all that stuff that we all lived with as, as, as kids growing up. Um, and it's still, it's still in my head. I, I still, you know, see, you know, I've done this myself and I, I'm not proud of it, but I, you know, you still see parents when a child is crying and a child comes to you and they're crying because they're feeling some emotion, whether it be pain or just emotional pain. What do we say to that child, the little toddler? We say, oh, don't cry, don't cry. Come on, come on, come on. Shh, 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 you know, shush, 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 shush. We're literally saying, can you stop having that emotion, please? Because I don't want you to feel it. I don't want to feel it, right? So I think we have to be really careful about how we speak, particularly about, particularly the kids in this way, but adults just the same. You know, I, I often think um, when someone is telling you something that's really sad in their life, that some, they've lost someone to death in their life, or they've, you know, they've lost, you know, whatever, they're going through some sort of grief. A lot of people will say, oh, you know, stay strong, stay strong. And I always wonder if the translation of stay strong is, oh shit, if you could just control your emotions, please, because I don't really want to have one. You know, why should someone else have to stay strong? That's a terrible thing to say to someone, especially if they're not feeling very strong. Because then they go away, just feel with even more shame and more kind of disappointment. I, I, I try not to say that stuff and I don't love it when people say it to me, <laughs> um, which I might tell them. But, you know, I, I think it's all part of this feeling things that we were told not to particularly again i'm sorry ladies particularly again as a man we were we were definitely told and are still told by the media by you by a lot of the world you know not to feel things and maybe that's why six out of eight australians that will die from suicide today are men find balance Balance, balance, balance is very, very important. I don't think work-life balance exists anymore because there's a, this our work and our life, particularly in the middle of this pandemic, has changed so much. But there's still balance that we can find. You know, there's still fun. Find some fun. Fuck's sake, find some fun. Like it's not that hard to find. And and some people just and you know you might have people in your life too. You might be this person in your life that just can't seem to find fun at the moment. And I think it's really sad, you know, it's really hard to be around people like that. It's really hard for you to be around someone who can't find fun. And if you can't find any fun in your life, it's really hard to be around you too, let me tell you. That balance can come from all sorts of things. Sometimes we do need to work hard. Sometimes we do need to put more hours into our business, into our job, into our children, into our relationship, into whatever we're trying to be successful at. Sometimes we do need to do that. Sometimes we need to sit under a tree and do fuck all. 
you know, like the, it is that balance that we that the media never speaks about. They talk about work life balance as if this 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 thing that if you can't get, then you're some sort of failure. Like I, I hate that idea. So let's think about how you can find balance and 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 work work harder on that too. Be a teacher. I think teaching is is wasted just on teachers. You know, I think that we can all be a teacher. I, I know I'm, I've said for a long time that in my children's case their most important teacher, teachers in their life don't uh, don't teach at their school right? they're not they're not teaching them at school it's 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 me and their mum you know and i think we can all be teachers i think we can all teach we just need to understand that that's our that, that is a role that we can fill and that we can do a good job of it we've all got something to teach we've all got something to influence somebody else with just as much as we've all got something to learn Second last one then is to lead with kindness. I talk about kindness a lot. I think it's a superpower that we've, for, for a large number of us, um, we've, we've kind of lost track of, you know, we've lost it as an as a important influential thing in our life. And I think that's sad. There's no downside to kindness. It's just the greatest superpower we have. It's free. It's, you know, it's, it, there's, there's million and one different reasons why kindness is important and why we should all try and be as kind as we can, as often as we can. And especially when we can spend some of that kindness on ourselves, you know, speak about ourselves well, love ourselves well, be kind to ourselves, super important. And then the last one is to be you. That's plenty, you know. I don't, if you try and be someone else, if you try to be like someone else, the chances are you're just getting up a bit of a shit version of them. Just like if you're in the, in, in the business world, if you're trying to have your brand be like the market leader, you're probably just going to end up being a kind of poor version of the market leader. There's plenty of space for us to be ourselves. There's plenty of space for new things, plenty of space for different stuff. I think that if you can show up authentically as trying to be you and encouraging people to interact with you as you, then that's, that's a great step towards either finding your resilience or never needing to look for it in the first place. So that's it, guys. Uh, I hope that you get something from those 13 steps. If, uh, if you don't agree with them, I'd love to hear about that too. But, you know, I think that they're the things that have really helped me and continue to help me in my day-to-day -day life, you know, going forward from, from this moment in every part of my life. I try and think about where my resilience has got me how I might use it in the future. And if I do need, to find, do need it in the future, I know where to find it now. You know, I will just stress again that we all have resilience. We can all use it. We don't have to, we, you're not someone who was born without it. You just weren't, right? It's just a matter of so far, maybe in your life so far, you haven't needed it. And God, more power to you if you haven't, good for you. But if you ever do need it, it is there. And, and a big part of that is being able to connect to other people who can tell you, hey, you're not doing so well. Can I help? Can I show you some kindness? Can you accept some kindness? It's a big, big deal. This is me. If you are interested in uh, having me speak at your event, either online, as I do a lot now on, on Zoom or Skype or Teams, um, or back in the real world, once we get into the real world too, you can check me out at nickbowditch.com slash speaking. Thank you very much for uh, joining me today <laughs> from my lounge room. Uh, I'm sorry that you couldn't be in Brisbane in front of you know, 400 people in an auditorium, but I hope that it's still been of some value if you've gotten right through this all the way through the 45 minutes of this Prezzo. I really hope you've had a great day today and you continue to find some kindness and spend some of that kindness on yourself. Have a great day, everyone. See ya.